Hello and welcome to another episode of Test, Optimize, and Scale. It's a joy to have Amir Reichman, CEO of Beyond Vax, here with us today. Amir, thank you for taking the time to jump on the show. Thank you, Jason, for having me on the show. My pleasure. And have enjoyed our discussions. Want to familiarize the audience a bit more with yourself, your journey into the creation of Beyond Vax. Where did it all begin? Sure. So um, I'm originally born and raised in Israel. I'm a biotechnology engineer with a master's in biotechnology engineering. I, my first uh, encounter with uh, entrepreneurship started when I uh, graduated my my uh, bachelor's degree. I, I looked for, for, for some interesting project to work on. And uh, one of the pharmacology professors that I... Uh, uh, worked with, he told me, hey, you know, I have a very interesting uh, patent for drug delivery across the skin, transdermal delivery of drugs uh, for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. I thought it was super cool, and I suggested I'll build the prototype of this machine for my bachelor's engineering graduating uh, project. Uh, he was, uh, so I, I went with that. I won the first prize in the university. It was a small small prize, I think 500 bucks. Um, and with the money, I basically, um, you know, created a nice poster and uh, sent it to, uh, to a conference in New York. And I couldn't attend the conference because of, uh, uh, I was still, uh, you know, uh, at the reserve forces and I had to go and serve my, my time in the reserve forces. And my professor went to, instead of me to the, to the conference. And then he came back and said, hey, you know, um, your poster won first prize uh, for young entrepreneur, young scientists. And uh, we actually got ourselves a grant from a very famous person, Michael J. Fox. Uh, Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's disease basically granted us a million dollar um, to start uh, and develop this uh, into a venture. So I continued uh, with this uh, project uh, throughout my master's as uh, the first employee of a small company that we started called Neuroderm. Um, and then uh, this company grew grew quite rapidly. Um, we sold it in 2017 to Mitsubishi Tanabe Pharma for $1.1 billion cash. So that was a very, very nice uh, start for my career as a, an entrepreneur. You know, um, I didn't, of course, pocket uh, even a fraction of this one because I was a young scientist student that developed it. But um, I can say that it was a very nice ride and a, a massive experience. So I didn't stay with Neuroderm till its end, until the exit. I, I left in 2009. Uh, I think for a good reason, I got scholarship uh, to study at the Wharton Business School. And then I moved with family to Philadelphia and started to study my MBA. Um, and upon graduating from the MBA, I decided to stay in the United States and uh, work a little bit. And I worked in, with Novartis vaccines um, and diagnostics in Cambridge, out of Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, I worked there in R&D, developing vaccines, then worked, went down to North Carolina and uh, was working part, as part of the global supply chain organization. I was responsible there for uh, the pediatric portfolio of the vaccines, then later on for the entire portfolio of vaccines um, as the head, global head of uh, value chain management. And I, with this role, I traveled across the world for supervising production and supplies from different sites in Europe, in Asia, and the United States. And in 2015, our company was acquired by GSK Vaccines, and I moved with my family to Brussels, where I, where I, I stayed and uh, worked there in the global headquarters of GSK Vaccines, and worked in global roles you know, such as engineering, supply chain, etc. And in 2020, actually, we took a, a family decision. My, my son uh, was about to celebrate his bar mitzvah. Um, and, uh, you know, my wife and I decided that it, maybe it's time to return back to Israel. I took a chance because there was a restructuring of the GSK organization and there was a nice uh, package for early leavers, and I decided to leave. And then a week later, after I sent my CV across to Israel and my wife was still in a panic attack that I won't get a job and we're going to relocate, um, you know, without any future, 
uh, a board member from BioNVax called me and said, hey, you know, uh, we have a problem. Can you help us with this problem? So here I'll take you back now to what is BioNVax and how, how did I go uh, get, uh, got into this uh, uh, interesting sure. uh, situation. So BioNVax was actually founded by an entrepreneur called Ron Babikov. Ron about 17 years ago, decided to take a spin-off from the Weizmann Institute. It's a renowned research institute out of Israel uh, with a mission to develop a universal influenza vaccine. Basically, a, a vaccine that will allow you to get uh, a, one vaccine and then that you won't have to take any seasonal vaccine anymore in your life. And that was a big promise. It was a spin-out from the... Uh, uh, from the uni from uh, from the lab of uh, Professor Ruth Arnon. Professor Ruth Arnon is a world-renowned scientist. She was the co-developer of Copaxone, the multi multiple sclerosis drug of Teva, multi-billion drug. And there was a massive promise. So the company developed the vaccine throughout uh, the preclinical trials, phase one, multiple phase twos, including one with NIH, and a phase three uh, that spanned over seven countries. 105 hospitals and 12,400 participants. The phase three took place between 2018 and 2020, exactly when I resigned from GSK, just by by, by coincidence. Um, but when the envelopes were opened, unfortunately, the drug candidate failed to meet primary endpoints. Mm. And this, so, so basically it failed the phase three. So the company went into a distress. So that was the pitch of the, the, the board member that contacted me. said, listen, we have a company. The team is massive, is excellent, super team. They know how to develop drugs from zero to 100. They know how to manage budget. They know they, we have massive labs. We have built an aseptic manufacturing facility in anticipation of the launch of the vaccine, which will not be launched, but we own our own site. Um, however, you know, um, we only le were left with uh, two and a half million dollars in the bank and the IP basically flopped. Uh, do you think we can do something with that? Take a few days and come up with the, you know, with the business plan and present it to the board. And so that was my first challenge. I went uh, back to the board a couple of days later and said, listen, uh, I think I can take it. I think it's an ex excellent opportunity and I'll tell you why. Because in a way, it is now, let's say that we now in license a new technology to the company. It, it will become an, a new company with at the very early stage, right? But it will have a massive arbitrage over other companies, a massive, a massive uh, competitive edge because the team is super experienced. The team is already the team already knows how to work together. The team has experience with running preclinical trials, clinical trials, chemical manufacturing and controls, quality systems. Everything works. It's an oiled machine. Also, the capacity and the capabilities are there. Indeed, we don't have the technology, but if we raise enough money with a nice business plan, we can in license the technology, and then we can have a good start. And indeed, we, we, we went to a, a consulting firm, LEK, it's a, a renowned healthcare consulting firm. Um, and so three people from, from the firm, the, the, the uh, senior partner from, uh, from uh, Boston was an engaged, uh, one partner from London and one partner from, from Munich. And we looked into this problem and said, okay, what can we do to rejuvenate this company and restructure it in a way that will generate now value to um, to the investors in, in, in the best way. So the first lesson learned from the previous kind of bad experience, because again, we built a lot of fundamentals, but it failed, was that the company needs to have a pipeline. We can't be a one trick pony anymore, right? So if we do an in-licensing agreement, it should be a platform in the platform should have several products in its pipeline of R and D. So if one fails, a second one can succeed. Secondly, we wanted the, the pipeline to be de-risked. So what, what does it mean de-risked? If you look at the main uh, risks that uh, 
that uh, a, 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 an entrepreneur or a drug developer uh, encounter, these are A, I need to know what is my target molecule, right? Mm. B, I need to know the, uh, the mechanism of action of my drug on the target molecule. C, I need to have a very good drug and it needs to be under patent so I can make money. And D, um, I need to have a market opportunity. I need to have, you know, an unmet need. There needs to be a, a growing market, uh, nice Kagar, etc. And then we said, you know what? Let's let's uh, take this kind of criteria. Let's make sure that this pro, pro, uh, the, this technology can also fit into the knowledge and experience of my team. So it has to be biologics. It has to be a biotechnology driven. It has to be a fermentation based drug that will utilize either bacteria or yeast fermentation because that's the the bread and butter of the team, um, and that it will fit to our manufacturing site. So there we went and started due diligence. Uh, we scouted uh, many technologies, and then we landed on a, a very interesting technology called uh, nanobodies. So nanobodies are camelid-based antibodies. And we decided then we went and, and closed a contract with the Max Planck Institute. And that was a very that this was my first massive success with with the company because. Being a partner with Max Planck Institute, and the second institute is University Medical Center Göttingen, which is one of the top 10 hospitals in Germany, is a massive success. Just imagine the caliber of this uh, organization. Max Planck has won 23 Nobel Prizes since World War II. Two of them in chemistry and physics just last year. These are you know, areas that are very relevant for our industry, right? And we happen to have the ability to close the contract with one of the 12 directors of the Max Planck Institute. So that a high caliber uh, professor um, and a highly cited uh, professor. And uh, you know, many times when you do a, F a PhD, people tell you, don't tell me what is the topic of the PhD, show me your professor. And it's very important because the caliber of the professor tells a lot about the chances of success, about the depth of understanding of the technology. There is a, you know, biology is not high tech. There is a lot of unknown underlying your inventions all the time. And the better, the, 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 high, the higher the quality of the professors and the scientific team below them in the research institute, the higher the chances that this uh, will actually move into becoming a drug. And so why did we, and so we, we, cre we cut uh, with them uh, two main uh, licenses. The first one was a, 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 an exclusive license uh, for um, development and commercialization of a nanobody and small antibody for the treatment and prophylactic prevention of, of uh, COVID-19. In addition to that, we signed another contract, which is a five-year strategic contract that allows us for exclusive option, for exclusive license, for development and commercialization of up to nine additional nanobodies, antibodies against selected targets that we selected specifically with LEK. And so how did we come about the selection of these targets? We said, listen, we want to de-risk the, the program. And I gave you before the four risks, right? The target yes. molecule, the mechanism of action, your drug, and the commercial risk. So the target molecule, we said, we don't want to, inno to innovate on that. We want a target molecule that is fully validated by others to exert a, a, a beneficial clinical response with the patients. Give you an example. If you target interleukin 17A, you will get a positive or a, a beneficial response with psoriatic patients. If you target interleukin-13, you will get a response for asthma. If you target uh, a, a VEGF, you, you can uh, have a good response with wet AMD, the macular degeneration. So we did not want to innovate on the target. Target are fully validated. We know that they're there. If we are able to neutralize them, we will have a good drug. The mechanism of action, 
we don't want to innovate on that as well because we know we wanted those targets that have all not only been proved that if you attack them they will exert good clinical response but if you attack them with an antibody they will create a good clinical response why because we knew we come with an antibody so we don't we are basically took off again a second risk which is the mechanism of action we know that if you attack this target with an antibody you get a good clinical response and so with these two risks taken off the table you just shaved out 200 million seven years of development and so that's a de-risking strategy that we applied um, this is this is incredible you know breaking this all down don't even want to interrupt i feel like i'm there with you on the storyline you know from neuroderm and what you were able to create and be a part of over those years uh and as you mentioned being able to see what success looks like, be able to see what mass distribution looks like and across Parkinson's um, targets. And I have family members affected. So to imagine what those conversations were like 15, 20 years plus back, uh, remarkable. Th then taking that, partnering with groups with patents, being able to, to be involved uh, in so many different areas of the supply chain, of the development, of the ma management, uh, partnering with GSK and the, these massive organizations and being at the, the forefront uh, of vaccine development. Uh, it's so interesting hearing your ABCD too, with the, the molecule, is, is the chemical actually good, is what's the market opportunity, all the different elements uh, of what validates what you are going to physically invest your time into, the, the impact you want to have in the world and, and for your company. Uh, and then learning more about BioNVax. And you know, you're, you're talking about the the two different licenses. And going back to just just for a moment uh to the the nanopods, the the antibodies uh, around COVID-19. At the time you guys decided to go that direction, how many different companies were, were doing this? Lots of companies were doing the, were doing uh, similar things. Uh, I know that, uh, and even today, some companies will look at me and say, ah, COVID, it's so 2020. And I'll tell you something. When you see it clear, um, you know, and you check yourself again and again and you see that it's clear uh, you, you know that you know sometimes there is there are trends you'll ask a seasoned investor why don't you invest in the in the in the in the covid they're not seasoned enough in the in the in the area you know it's kind of, kind of a trend everybody's like the fomo but the other way around so everybody's not investing in COVID, so they won't invest in COVID. Mm. But if you look, I, I look at things as they are, and I, I look at the numbers, even Pfizer pers uh, published them. 110 million infections in 2022 of COVID-19. Okay, it's a fact. It's measurable. 112 million infections are projected to 2023. It's actually an increase. Why? And that's excluding China. Why? Because the waning effectivity of the vaccines. So the vaccines become less effective. People are, you know, are starting to get delayed with their boosters, less people get boosters. And so the immunity of us as a society is going down. Now, out of the 110 or 112 next year, this year of infections, about 17% require antiviral in order um, to not get hospitalized. Okay, or not to sure. get worse. This is a massive segment. Think about it. How many people you are targeting now, right? So we are talking about a, 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 a circa 20 million potential patients per year. Now, these patients now receive only one drug, mainly 90% market share, Paxlovid. It's a drug by Pfizer. Now look at Paxlovid. I look at the numbers of Paxlovid and I see the following. First of all, Paxlovid sold, if I'm not mistaken, about $750 a treatment. And Paxlovid is underutilized. So basically research now shows that Paxlovid is basically capturing about 20% of its market potential. Why? Because Paxlovid 
is, uh, has a side of, uh, 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 many side effects of related to drug to drug interactions or counter indications Be and uh, mainly it 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 creates a, 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 an imp a, um, inter interference with your liver uh, cleavage of uh, different uh, metabolites and drugs so now think about who who is my target uh, my, my target audience or me who is my target patient Who's the customer for an antiviral drug? A person at risk of age with comorbidities, either diabetic or with a high uh, uh, body weight, with uh, recovering from cancer, still sick from cancer, uh, uh, taking statins, a heart attacks, history, et cetera, et cetera. But guess what? Many of these cannot benefit from Paxlovid because exactly of the drug-to-drug -drug interactions and counterindications. So there is a massive, massive underserved population that would benefit from receiving a safe, self-used, inhaled drug. So now look at my target product profile. I will provide you with an inhaler, which is small. Think about like, uh, you know, the electric cigarette. You take a puff, five seconds, twice a day, five days, and you're good. Self-administered. No, no, we don't expect to have uh, uh, severe side effects. We need still to prove it in the clinic, of course. But if you think about the molecule, our molecule is a, so if there is a virus, we attack the virus. Paxlovid and other small molecule drugs, they operate on your biochemical pathways in your body. So they prevent the virus from multiplying and, uh, uh, you know, propagating in your in your body. But you know, when you mess up with uh, biochemical pathways in the body, you mess up with the body because these biochemical pathways were there for a reason. Some of us will say evolution. Some of us will say God. Doesn't matter what you believe in. The biochemical pathways were there. When you mess up with them, some side effects occur, right? Sure. So our drug is just a targeted warhead, boom, to the virus. So it doesn't plan to be interacting with anything in your body. And therefore, the adverse effects is going to be much uh, lower. The other thing is that we proved in preclinical trials that this drug can be used as prophylactic. So when we applied it to the hamsters, we infected hamsters with COVID. When we gave them the, the, the drug in a prophylactic way, three hours before the infection, they, did, they, they, they were immune from con contracting the infection. So they didn't, got sick. they didn't get sick. Now, imagine this kind of uh, small cigarette you want to go, you know, you are part of a, you are part of a at-risk population, all these people that I just described. You are part of a health responders. You are a traveler. You want to go to a conference. You want to hop on a commercial flight. Um, you, you just have anxiety and you don't want to get sick. You take a puff, 12 hours, full protection, Israeli iron shields in your, in your lungs. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> a, it's a different... Uh, mindset. When you take a vaccine today, you don't have an indicator on your hand telling you, oh, your immunity is good. If you, somebody with COVID will come across, you won't get infected. You have no clue. You might get infected, you might not. Your, your antibody level might be high, might be low. We have no clue. When you take the puff, you have full control. Sure. You take the antibody and you know that for the next 12 hours, you're protected. So we, we see a massive op uh, opportunity with this uh, COVID uh, drug. And as you said, your focus is safe, self-use, you're physically administering it yourself, you're, you're tracking to see your different levels. I imagine you're getting outstanding responses from the community and the need for this type of solution is massive. Um, I, have to, I have to ask, I mean, to hear about what's behind the scenes and testing you know, with hamsters, with COVID, how is it working in this space post 2020? I mean, the word vaccine has become controversial, even polarizing uh, in, in many communities that the US included. Uh, I imagine it, it's tough for yourself to hear about so many people doing their own research and basing it on, on false studies. And in many cases, misinformation around the topic has been documented at, at massive levels. What has that experience been like uh, f for someone in your field, f for you know a biopharma expert 
uh, and in the creation of these new product lines and, and anticipating, predicting what the general public's response will be? And it's an excellent question because on one hand, it frustrates me that this has been the response. But I think that resisting to uh, the market will bring no good. No in, uh, entrepreneur or marketer did well by trying to resist the, the market perception and by just constantly trying to prove them wrong. I think that what you need to do is say, okay, here's this, this is the situation. How do I give my patients and who are my customers the best health, best protection, yes. catering to their needs? So what are they afraid of? Active immunity, being vaccinated prior to being infected? I have a solution for you. Our self-inhaler is a drug. It's not a vaccine. So you take it only if you are infected. And so that's one thing. Second thing, it's a passive immunization. So our drug doesn't activate your immune system. When you take a vaccine, it activates your immune system and generates antibodies that are self. It's much longer lasting, but those that are afraid from being injected with, uh, with a drug before being infected, will find it as a relief because you take it only when you're infected, it's inhaled, it's not injected, it doesn't generate your uh, uh, any response from your, your in, uh, uh, immune uh, system, it just adds another layer of antibodies into the mucos uh, area of mucosal area in your lungs and provides a shield. And when you don't need them, you urinate them. So you cater to these, you know, um, thoughts and needs, and you give that. But in, in doing that, we actually were able to show another thing. Because when you do that, and you do it either for treatment or prophylactic, so you can take it also before you get infected, suddenly you see, oh, you know what? It's a paradigm shift. So now let's say, let's put ourselves, so you know, in the pharma industry, you have the three Ps, the patient, the payer, and the provider. So I just talked about the patient's point of view. But let's talk about the payer. Payer are either the insurance companies in the US, but also governments and also here in the US, it's until now it's still funded by the government until I think May. Um, governments have a had a choice in the past. Every time there is a pandemic, the immediate gun was vaccine. But when to uh, deploy this gun or, uh, or weapon, one needs to inoculate, basically vaccinate in the day-to-day -day language, the whole population in a massive compliance requirement in order to create the herd immunity. So you are fully dependent on others, right? If they don't get vaccinated because they are like, uh, you know, free riders, you get screwed up because they basically don't protect you. you. And the higher the infectivity rate, COVID has massive infectivity rate, the higher the compliance rate required in order to generate the herd immunity. So the concept is a, is a failed concept when you have so many people that resist it. However, if you just take a drug, which is a passive immunity, and you apply it laser pointed to those that are at need, those of age, those that are at risk groups, etc., either when they get infected or before they go to at-risk areas to be prophylactically prevent, uh, protected, you don't need to provide and buy and, 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 and market and administer and supply so many vaccines. You just need to give them to those that have been infected. So instead of injecting, I don't know, billions of vaccines around the world, I think seven or eight billion doses around the world, you could actually administer 110 million doses to those that have been infected. Maybe double that for the prophylactic, 220 million. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a several magnitudes reduction in the cost to the payers. And, and treatment, being able to focus there and have that type of monitoring, self-administration uh, fr from those users versus some type of mandate and having a large spread uh, distribution. 
And I, I love what you said about being an entrepreneur, finding uh, you know a problem, being able to address the solution. Uh, I, I hope this podcast gets out to enough people to be able to to hear about this and, and spread accordingly from there. And it, it's great being able to focus on your product, your company, to such a great degree here. I, I want to move a bit. To, to how you've been able uh, to be able to to really build this platform in the industry for yourself, this level of success, and even package actionable insights for listeners around it. How do you recommend founders go about testing to get to this point um, uh, of product refinement? How did Beyond Vax go through all of the different research of what's occurring in the space, what's working, what's not working, what's really more for the business, what, what is the best for the end user, the, the patient. Uh, what tactics do, do you take to, towards testing? I look at uh, the scientific method, test optimized scale uh, is our approach towards it for marketing and a series of tests to be able to get the appropriate data to, to find the behavior to, to optimize and then replicate or do at scale. Uh, what what have been your philosophies towards testing and to be able to get to the state that you're at today? No, it's an excellent question. I think uh, it is. Uh, so it depends. Uh, you know, the the when I when I went to the large uh, uh, players from uh, Neuroderm as an entrepreneur, um, I realized that large players apply a, a methodology called quality by design. Mm. It's very very important to implement quality attributes into your drug when you develop it, right? So when you design the drug, so you don't then have problems to scale up and to ensure quality standards in commercial manufacturing process. So the, the quality by design principles are out there. There are many books on that. You need to ensure that you either learn them or you hire more, more important is to hire and consult with people that have either experienced or are knowledgeable in this area. The other thing um, that we implemented immediately in that uh, we paid training, I just brought a trainer, we bought the right softwares for that, etc. is the DOE, Design of Experiment Principles, um, to ensure that when we, uh, uh, we create um, the uh, the, the experiments, we use the, mo the best and optimal ways to design the experiments. Because when you have a hypothesis, you need to prove that it works. You need to create, uh, you need to create an experiment and you need to, to create data that will then prove it uh, in a statistical significant way. But there are many, many, many iterations of the same experiment with different variations of different parameters that one needs to conduct. So today there are two main things that you can overcome this problem. One is the design of experiment methodology. The second one is using uh, uh, computerized systems. Mm. So Max Planck, for example, uses an AI driven uh, or more like it's more of a machine learning driven uh, uh, software that has op enables them to optimize. I'll give you an example. We when we when we when we vaccinate an alpaca to generate the nanobodies because uh, nanobodies are generated from alpacas um, and, and we create a, a library, the library can contain up to 300 million options. How can you select the few nine nanobodies, five nanobodies that you want to go and continue to develop, you, you need to have a, a methodology to, to, to find it. Otherwise, it will take you years to you know sort through these massive libraries. Um, and so you need to be very uh, skillful in how you deploy this, uh, A, the uh, computerized systems, B, the basic bread and butter of DOE design of experiment. Um, the, the but these things I, I so the first thing I, I learned of the quality by design I learned from uh, GSK, the design of experiment uh, I learned I actually brought with me I have to give the credit to Novartis I studied quite a lot there about design of experiment, and the AI um, I, I looked at that uh, you know the Max Planck I have to give the full credit they use these softwares. Um, etc. The the next thing is about the TPP, which is the target product profile. I think this is something that we try to innovate on. 
So the way I look at that, I'm also, uh, you know, in my background, before I started all my entrepreneurship, et cetera, in my sins, I'm also a, a military veteran. I served just seven years in the Armored Corps. Um, and so basically, um, uh, let's say that our nanobody is the warhead, right? Um, we then need to decide how this ammunition will arrive to its target, right? We have a, you have a molecule that you don't want it to be there. It's too much abundant. Uh, it's, it, you know, for example, the interleukin in the skin or in the lungs. So I want it to be reduced in the body. I want to attack it. I want to be very precise, um, but I don't know what will be, how it will be delivered. Am I going to parachute it? Am I going to um, uh, uh, send it on a targeted missile? You know, the, the, the ways to deliver it are different. Do I want it to be delivered in a sustained release? Do I want it to be delivered in an acute one shot? I want it to be maybe coupled with another molecule, etc. So the design of the target product profile we basically said, this is not just a matter of, um, you know, brainstorming, deciding and, and just moving on and creating a target. No, we said, we know that we have that and we are humble. We said, listen, guys, we don't know. Some people will laugh at you. Some people will say, how, how do you want to develop a drug when you don't know the target product profile? And I say, listen, I have a massive warhead. I know it's amazing. Now I need to find the right bride for it. And we have created a project with best consultants from chemical manufacturing and controls, physicians, people that are in the research of these specific disease areas, um, um, marketing and commercial consultants from healthcare, etc. And so together with them, we created a project team. And this project team is delivering for each of these projects. We have a project team that is dedicated because one project team has to have the skills about psoriasis, the other one for asthma, the third one for uh, macular degeneration. These are different teams. Um, and each team need to deliver, the output will be the TPP, the target product profile. But when they deliver it, let's say they will give us, uh, they will give me as a CEO two to three options to choose, select from, I know already what will be the projection of potential sales um, how is it compared to the other competitive? So yes, it, does it, is it costly? You invest s several hundred thousands of dollars for each of these projects, but it sounds like a lot of money for an entrepreneur now, but you save millions down the road. And you also save yourself a lot of headache um, in uh, uh, the development timeline. So I'm sure you are going to squeeze down the development timeline and you significantly increase your chances of success both in the clinical trials and in the marketing. You know how many drugs I saw that finished phase three? Great results. FDA cleared them. Nada, no sales. Oof. Nice drug, but you know, there are others better. So, you know, you, you, sometimes as an entrepreneur, you need to ensure that you're not like a horse, you know, riding, you know that it's going to work. And let's say it's going to work. Is that a guarantee for a commercial success? No. You see, and so, so, need uh, that uh, data to tell you that on the yeah. commercial side that it's working and be able to scale into that. Right. And you, you've seen this happen firsthand. Again, now multiple stages in your past as well. How do you optimize? How do you prepare to, to scale you know, as you're getting these findings, let, let's say you, you hit the market and there's no responses. Is that the end for that drug, for that vaccine, uh, for, for that molecule? Or are there iterations that can be made to then take it back to market with those optimizations or even just improvements of the, the version one, if you will? You're getting a good response, but you want to get it to the, the next level and then be able to, to take it to a much larger scale from there. Taking a drug after it failed uh, um, in a commercial access is going to be quite hard. I can't say that it's impossible. It mm -hmm. is possible. Um, but I don't, I, I, I'd say my advice is try to think ahead. Like, uh, you know, Stephen Covey said, think with the end in your mind, try to prevent the failure. Sure. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about the scale up during the preparation for success. The scale up is also very, very important because part of the parameters I uh, gave to the Max Planck 
as parameters for acceptance for us to take the license are parameters that are not relevant for the either quality of the drug or for the potency of the drug. Mm -hmm. They are parameters that are relevant for the, our ability as a company to scale it up uh, uh, that to enable cost of goods that are uh, favorable for the company. So, you know, for example, uh, drugs in, in, in biologic drugs, uh, there is a process called purification. Purification is a very costly process. Uh, the, 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 if, you, if you design the molecule so it's easily purified, you saved yourself a lot of money and a lot of time. The same thing for the, ups, uh, the upstream. If you use the right plasmids with the right host cell, etc., and you have a massive yield, you can produce with high yield of protein and your cost per gram of protein will be significantly reduced. If you didn't think about it ahead of time, you will end up with a massive, potent, very good drug, cures you from cancer, but will cost you millions to produce, so it's not economically viable. So uh, the ability to scale up is something you have to implement in the, uh, in the acceptance criteria you give to this research center, to the university. Don't run and just license it in because they showed you amazing results on mice. Ask the right questions and check it. Can you scale it up? And second, the thing, don't try to do it all yourself. So for example, our strategy would be to license out to a large manufacturing organization when we have already the proof of concept, let's say phase two, because I think it's also irresponsible, not only to my investors, but also to the patients, that I'll just try to run with it all the way through. Let's say that I'm successful. Okay, we ran through, we finished phase three. And let's say it's actually a very good success. The worst thing you can have is you have an amazing drug, potent, and the market has massive demand, but you can supply because you haven't prepared for the scale up of your commercial manufacturing. And when you are a, a, a small entrepreneurial a, a, a entity, you won't be able to scale up on time just by your own means. You have to partner with other players that will help you to scale up. Also, when you are an entrepreneur, you, most probably you don't have the sales force with the right contacts and skills and training and, and marketing capabilities, etc., to make this drug a success. So it's very important not to to be, uh, you know, uh, greedy and say, oh, I will keep all the gold to myself and try to do it all myself. Partner with the best ones. Let them lead. Stay, drive the car from the back seat, at least in your first or second drug or even the third drug. Let them commercialize it. You take your royalties or milestones for development and take the proceeds and invest in further and developing your next pi in pipe in, in line a pipeline product and so the partnering is a super important stage for entrepreneur um, so because it will give you the capital the uh, validity you know mm. across the industry uh, the right access to other scientists because they have also scientists and it will guarantee that the cure you want to bring to the world will actually reach out to the uh, uh, to the patients in, in a, a, on time and where they need it. Uh, and so you need to think with the patient in your mind. Don't try to do it all yourself. That's a very important scale up uh, a, a mindset that you have to have, um, again, you know, uh, from, from the, uh, uh, when, we, when we talk uh, scaling up uh, points. In that planning stage, have the end consumer, the patient, the, the user in mind, be thinking of marketing strategic partnerships, actually using those towards the distribution to get to the critical mass needed and taking any any stages needed for optimization to get there. Amir, I, I feel like I've gotten the roadmap to uh, creating a VAX at this point. I imagine uh, it's, it's not even the surface uh, in terms of what's involved uh, on the engineering and science. Uh, but but I, I, I have to thank you for allowing you, me Jason. to step into your, your world here. It's beyond fascinating. And, and talk about finding a path that could benefit millions of people or more. It is truly remarkable. So th thank you for taking the time to hop in here. As we're wrapping up, 
if listeners uh, want to get in contact, what, what is the best way for them to do so, whether it's with, uh, you know, your organization as a whole or or you directly? And, and what final thoughts would you like to leave the audience with today? So first of all, I'd love to get feedback, what people think about it. Uh, do they have uh, thoughts or they have ideas? Even if they didn't like something, say, you know what? I listened to you. I think you're wrong. Tell me. I, I I I really want to listen and hear all of that because I'm only learning from you know my mistakes, not from my successes. Um, I benefit from my successes, but I learn mostly from my mistakes. Um, so I'm better catching I, I better catch up uh, catch them up uh, earlier as possible. So uh, if anybody has any feedback, feel free to reach out to me. You know you can reach out to me at Amir A M I R dot Reichman R E I C H M A N at biondvax.com um, and also uh, at uh, IR investor relations is IR at biondvax.com um, and uh, final thoughts you know I, I think that being an entrepreneur and also even, even during my uh, by uh, you know large corporate uh, multinational corporate uh, with the pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical industry you need to really love what you do. I, I love it. You know, I, I just enjoy the, the game. I, I enjoy creating this value. Um, and, and so when you do that out of passion and out of love, I think that's the that's the key for success. Otherwise, you won't have the energy for that because it's a tiring job. And, uh, you know, if, it, it, you know, it's a and it's not easy. You know, it sounds compelling. I explain it. It's very it sounds like as if I know what I'm doing and I do know what I'm doing, but I have a lot to learn and there is just a lot of work to be done, a lot. And as an entrepreneur, you always have your uh, your blanket short, you just work around the clock. And so, you know, it's not, it's, it's really about, uh, you, it really requires a person that really loves it. It's like my hobby, you know? So, when you love it in this way, it's like feeling, oh, I just went to golf with my friends all the day. If that's what you feel when you do this work, do it. If not, maybe not. Not <laughs> try to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> that old saying, enjoy what you do. You don't work a day of your life. Uh, and whether it's life, whether it's work, there's constant obstacles. And being able to overcome those and do it successfully and have those wins make it all worthwhile. Otherwise, it'd be too easy, right? Absolutely. Jason, thank you very much. Really enjoyed it. My pleasure. Thank you, Amir. And want to thank everybody for tuning in. We'll see you next time.